delighted to meet uh, so many uh, wonderful Christian people uh, from all around the world, and particularly, of course, uh, from Asia. Uh, the, uh, uh, we're going to be looking in due course on the Bible passage, Matthew 18, so you can have that passage open in front of you, it will be excellent. It introduces our theme, the theme of forgiveness, and uh, Peter came to Jesus and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? And Jesus said to him, I don't say to you seven times, but 77 times. In other words, a limitless amount. The gospel is a gospel of forgiveness. Forgiveness is a central gift of the gospel. And it's a very, very powerful gift indeed. Precisely because it's so quiet in its own way, it is very powerful. But what is forgiveness? This matter has come before me particularly in my role as Archbishop uh, because over the time in which I was Archbishop, I suppose about 30 people came to see into my office who had been abused as children by people professing to be Christians, particularly belonging to our denomination, and they told me their story. And in the name of our denomination, at least I was able to apologize. But there was always the question of forgiveness. And it came sharp as well because in our country here in Australia, we've been having a royal commission, an inquiry, on abuse of children in churches and other institutions. And again and again we've discovered that when abuse came to the knowledge of those in authority, again and again, those in authority forgave the offender and enabled them to continue their ministry. Is that what forgiveness is? After all, the Lord Jesus said, you will not forgive seven times, you will forgive 77 times. And the precious gift of the gospel is forgiveness. So how is it? Is it right that people should forgive such offenders? And what does that mean? That is why it is a particular subject for me, I have to say, and what I'm going to say to you, I don't believe, is the last word on the subject. It is something for you to ponder on and think about. As with all such talks, sermons and so forth, you need to read your Bible yourself to see whether what I say is true. And I say to you now that I'm still struggling with some aspects of this subject. Let me give you an outline of what I intend to say this afternoon. The outline should be on the screen. The heart of reconciliation, we have been talking about reconciliation. The picture of forgiveness in the New Testament. Analyzing forgiveness, what is it? And then applying forgiveness. And can I say that as we come to the end and talk about applying forgiveness, there will be many of us here for whom this is a burning issue. Because there may be people in your life that you have never been able to forgive, possibly family members, and then there may be things for which you yourself know you need to be forgiven, and you have not taken the step necessary. And so that is where we're going to end up, and I warn you that it can be a little painful as we think about it. Yesterday, we were reminded that God has reconciled us to himself. He has forgiven us. But more than that, he searched for us, he found us, and he carried us home, so to speak, on his shoulders. He searched, found, and carried me home. And we heard about the heart of reconciliation. This is the first of the topics. Recon uh, uh, sorry, I've skipped over something important. There are some key words which I am going to use in the rest of what I say, and I thought I would give you an explanation of those key words before going further. So if we could first of all say the word forgiveness, and I'm going to say to you that I think that forgiveness is the action of giving up the right to recompense, justice or revenge, and to accept the cost yourself. You have a right to be angry 
but you say, I won't be angry. You have a right to revenge. You have a right to justice. You say, no, I will accept that cost. I will not be angry. I will not take justice out on you. Forgiveness. The second word is reconciliation. Reconciliation, we heard yesterday, to make peace, which restores relationship, moving from enmity to family. I was the enemy of God. Now I am the son of God, the daughter of the living God. Reconciliation. The third word is repentance. Repentance generally is confessing that we are in the wrong and it is to turn to the other person and seek reconciliation, to put yourself in right relationship with the other person. I have been wrong. Uh, if need be, I will recompense. I seek your forgiveness. Please enter me back into reconciliation with you. So, uh, it, it is also, of course, repentance is what happens when we turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and make him the Lord of our lives. Recompense is another word. To recompense is to pay back, to compensate. You have done something wrong, you have caused hurt to the other person, you may be able to compensate for that hurt, to make good. Sometimes it's not possible. The hurt is not that sort of hurt. You have said something which is so painful. Sometimes it is simply repentance itself. I am sorry I said that. I was in the wrong. I should never have said that. And so you give re recompense through repentance. Recompense to pay back, to compensate, to make good. And then the word restoration to be fully restored to a role or position. And you imagine a, a husband who has betrayed his wife, and he realizes how wrong he was, and he comes to his wife, and he seeks forgiveness, he seeks reconciliation, and he seeks restoration. I would want to be your husband again. Is that possible? And some of the illustrations I'm going to use come from marriage and family life, because this is where Mostly, fundamentally, this business of forgiveness and repentance is so important. And so much pain and suffering occurs in family life. But it is also the point at which we Christians have something to give to family life that the world does not have. Because we have been reconciled to God by his great gift of forgiveness. I've given you the outline, I've now given you an explanation for the vocabulary I'm going to use. You can see that doing this after lunch is not the best time to do this talk. <laughs> and I'll have words afterwards with those who gave it to me. I am angry with them. <laughs> forgive, forgive. <laughs> I turn now to the first, the heart of reconciliation. I will not spend long here because this is what we talked about yesterday. Reconciliation is to make peace which restores relationship moving from enmity to family. There's always a cost involved. When a person accepts reconciliation, does make the forgiveness, there is a cost. And we saw yesterday when, when God reconciles us to himself, it is at the cost of the death of his son in which he bore the sin, so that the God who said, I will never acquit the guilty, does acquit the guilty, but only because he bears the cost in himself on the tree. How could this go further? What do we think about, however, with forgiveness? repentance, recompense, and restoration. And that's where I'm going now. So I come now to the second point, the picture of forgiveness. And here we particularly turn to a famous Bible passage, Acts chapter, I beg your pardon, Matthew chapter 18, and particularly verses 23 to 34. This is the story that the Lord Jesus told and I will just retell the story rather than read the passage, though we should read the passage, but I'll just tell it. About the man who came 
with, who owed the king 10,000 talents, all the money in the world, basically. And since he could not pay, the master ordered him into slavery with his wife and children until payment could be made. In other words, never. So the servant <laughs> fell to his knees, imploring the king, have patience, I will pay you everything. How stupid he was, but I can understand him saying that. He couldn't pay. And out of pity for him, the master of the servant released him and forgave him the debt. Who paid the debt? The master paid the debt. He accepted that he was never going to get his money back, and he said, I will bear the cost of that. Forgiveness always costs. It costs the one who forgives, most of all. Then the servant went out and he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a trivial amount, a hundred denarii, and he began to choke him and said, you've got to pay me, you've got to pay me. And the fellow servant said, have patience, I will pay you. And he refused and he put his fellow servant into jail. And then the rest of the servants went and told the king and the king took the original man who owed the 10,000 and put him into jail until all his debt should be paid. And Jesus says, verse 35, why don't we all read verse 35 together? Are you ready? So also my heavenly Father will do treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. From your heart. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us, is the teaching of Jesus. Here then is the picture of forgiveness. We see that the servant who owed all that money was forgiven. He was repentant and in fact he was restored because he was still a servant. The king didn't say, I forgive you but leave. He said, you can continue as my servant. And he did. He restored him. He forgave him. He was repentant. He was repentant. He was forgiven. He was restored. The king paid the debt himself. He understood the repentance to be real. He was, so to speak, reconciled to the servant. The servant then acted so badly towards another servant and he showed that his repentance was not real. Had he understood the grace he had received from the king, then he could not have acted in that way towards his fellow servant. His repentance was not real, and therefore the king dealt with him. That is the story that the Lord Jesus told. No doubt the servant regretted what he'd done, the 10,000 talents. No doubt he was remorseful for what he'd done. He felt very sorry. No doubt he feared the king, yes, but he didn't have true repentance, or otherwise he would have understood the grace and mercy of the king, and he would have acted in the same way towards his fellow servant. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Our forgiveness flows out of his forgiveness of us. The third heading here, analyzing forgiveness. What then can we say about this? Let me remind you again that this can be, and maybe for you, a very painful subject. In Australia, Christmas Day is one of the saddest days of the year because the mother of each family longs for her family to come together and have Christmas dinner together and to be happy as they were when they were little children. And yet by that time, so many people have quarreled, so many people don't like each other, so many people will not sit down and eat because eating is a sign of forgiveness and fellowship that when it comes to Christmas Day, they sit there in misery and hatred, and there is often fighting 
Indeed, for many people, Christmas Day is the saddest day of the year because it reminds them that their family is fractured and they have no forgiveness in the family. What should be the birth of our Saviour, the forgiver of sins, turns into misery. That is how painful forgiveness and lack of forgiveness is. Let us try to analyse what we mean by forgiveness. Forgiveness is usually offered without a word being spoken. Those of you who are married will know that you often forgive your wife, you often, more often, forgive your husband without any word of sorry, without perhaps the husband knowing that he has offended you, without the wife knowing. You live under God's forgiveness by forgiveness. And you don't constantly demand that your spouse will say sorry. You simply exercise patience and love for your spouse. And as Jesus said to Peter, I do not say to you forgive seven times, but 77 times. And in my marriage of 50 years, my wife has forgiven me 77 times 700 times and has never mentioned it. Because we live by grace and she gives me grace because she has received grace from our Heavenly Father. Amen. I take it. You know my wife. <laughs> we live by grace between husband and wife. And often we never mention the need for forgiveness. Sometimes, however, there is an offence which reaches a level where something needs to be said, and sometimes a very important level, where we need to have repentance on one side and forgiveness on the other. We need repentance because in repentance, and perhaps we can have that picture of repentance on the screen again, in repentance, in repentance we are prepared to admit that we are in the wrong. It is often difficult for us to admit that, as human beings, that we are in the wrong. It makes us feel without power. We heard today that leaders are often motivated by a quest for power. When you feel powerless, you become more angry. And it really requires you to understand that Jesus is Lord and that you owe him everything for you to be able to put your anger down and your pride down and your hunger for power down and to say, I am sorry, I did the wrong thing. Not, I'm sorry if you think I did the wrong thing, but I am sorry I did the wrong thing and I wish to now make up to you, I wish to have reconciliation, repentance. Forgiveness, forgiveness comes from grace. I have been forgiven, I will forgive. It is an obligation in the Christian life. We are obliged to forgive. But remember, it's not a law, it comes from grace. It is a law because it comes from grace. We are called upon to forgive. <coughs> Sometimes we find it very difficult to forgive for a couple of reasons. One is that we are threatened ourselves and we don't like to forgive. That is wrong. We need to deal with our unforgiving spirit and forgive, as Jesus said, from the heart because we have been forgiven. Sometimes, however, the offence against us is so significant that it takes time to practice forgiveness. I have referred to you about sexual abuse, for example. And in teaching pastors about this, I always say to them, do be careful not to say 
to the victim of sexual abuse or to some person, perhaps a wife who has been betrayed. Oh, you must forgive. Forgive. That's your job. Forgive. As though it is easy to do. As though your heart has not been torn out. Yes, the moment comes when the person who is the victim needs to decide, I will forgive. In a sense, they need to do it for themselves as much as anyone else. But remember that this is both a decision you make and a process you enter into. Often pastors are very cruel and they tell people to forgive instantaneously as though this is easy and as though they ought automatically to forgive and take the villain back. This is not what forgiveness means in the New Testament, I think. For if there is forgiveness, that is one thing. But where there is reconciliation, you need repentance on the other hand. I well remember a man who came and had dinner with me at my home and then a little while later he wrote a very, very, very nasty article about me and published it, which I did not read. I made it a habit of never reading that sort of stuff, but I knew about it. And the next time I met him, he said to me, do you forgive me? He wasn't a believer. He said, do you forgive me? And I said, my dear friend, of course I forgive you, but don't ask to come and have dinner with me again, <laughs> unless there is repentance. Of course I forgive, I'm bound to forgive, but he needs to do something on his side if there is to be reconciliation, and that is repentance. Perhaps that repentance will take the form of a, an apology, a real apology, a plea for forgiveness perhaps. Perhaps it will be restitution or recompense in some form or other. If you do repent, you have done something awful, you have repented, you go and repent before the person, fund this as a right. That is because you understand the grace of God that you will forgive not because he can force you to forgive. Repentance cannot be demanded. Reconciliation can't be demanded. But as Christians, of course, we wish to give it. Sometimes reconciliation is quite impossible. Sometimes the person who has deeply offended, as in some of these sexual abuse cases, sometimes the person is dead and is therefore not ever going to ask for forgiveness and repent. But it is still a burden on the soul and heart of the person who has been so, so, so badly hurt. If you have heard some of the stories that I have heard, you would weep. And to think that some of these people claim to be Christians when they permitted this abuse. <clears throat> but even so, the person so badly hurt will need, I believe, following the word of the Lord here, even though reconciliation is no longer possible, will still need to forgive. It won't be instantaneous. It will be a decision. And it will be a path. It will be a process. It won't be easy. The person will require fellowship, prayer. The person will require help. Don't put too many demands on a person who has been so badly traumatized as the ones I am talking about here. And then reconciliation, repentance, forgiveness, reconciliation, recompense perhaps. What about restoration? Can the person be restored? If, for example, a wife betrays a husband and then comes back and is repentant and seeks forgiveness and seeks reconciliation, as a Christian husband, 
I believe that you are bound to do this. But I don't believe that you are bound necessarily to restore the person to be your wife. The Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus teaches us that adultery breaks a marriage. Now, the husband may say, nonetheless, I still accept you back. But he is not bound to do so. He is not bound to restore the person. Again, this is important, particularly in the case of ministers and pastors uh, who betray the gospel by perhaps greed or lust or some other great sin that pastors sometimes do. Can the pastor be forgiven by God? Yes, if there is repentance. Can he be reconciled with God? Yes, if there is repentance. And he seeks reconciliation and he puts himself under the Lord Jesus again where he should have been all the time. Can he be forgiven by the congregation? Yes, when he repents. He can be forgiven in any case, but he, he can be, he can, there can be reconciliation of, the, of repentance. Can he then say, I wish to be restored as a pastor? No. Let us get this perfectly straight, brothers and sisters. For unfortunately, we have many bad examples of other things where people say, I have been forgiven, God has forgiven me, therefore I have a right to be restored. No, you have no such right. Any more than a husband has a right to become the husband again. Not at all. Restoration is another thing altogether. And I believe that once, my personal belief is that once a pastor commits a sin of that nature, then he loses his ministry. Yes, he is forgiven by the Lord. Yes, he is in Christian fellowship. All those things are true. But from now on, he serves the Lord in a different capacity and not restored to the place from which he has fallen. You may regard this as rather hard, but I fear that the reverse has brought great shame upon us as we have restored people to positions of authority who should never have been in that situation to start with. That is how I see it. Now quickly, applying forgiveness. Do I speak to you as a upright, righteous, virtuous man? No, I told you I've been married 50 years. I know I'm not that. I'm a great sinner. That's all I am. But Christ is a great Savior. His grace is amazing grace. In the New Testament, heaven is often spoken of as a meal, where one day we will all sit down. When Jesus was here on earth, he often ate with tax collectors and sinners. For when we eat together, it is a sign of reconciliation, it is a sign of peace, it is a sign of love between us, not just food, it is a fellowship meal which we are having in which we say we forgive each other. Hence the importance and the importance this afternoon of the Holy Communion or the Lord's Supper where we all sit around the Lord's table together claiming to be saved by the death of Jesus and saying therefore that we are in love and peace with each other. And if in fact any of you here is at war with any other person here, please do not come to the Lord's table until you have been reconciled. You must forgive your brother seven times, seventy times. And that is the Christian rule. But some things are very hard to forgive. And I want to speak now very personally, as I close, I want to speak to you very, very personally. Because I believe it is quite likely that some of you here are carrying great burdens of fights and quarrels, 
great burdens of hurt done to you, of people who have betrayed you and done the wrong thing to you. And you have found it extraordinarily hard to forgive. And I want to say to you today that that is understandable. But I want to say to you today that the Lord Jesus Christ, when he was being nailed to the cross, said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And he says to us, forgive your enemies. Forgive your enemies. That is his rule for us as Christians. You may say to me, I find it so hard to forgive because the hurt was so real and so true. I understand. I say to you, it is a great burden but the Lord Jesus has said to us in the scriptures, cast all your burdens on him. He will carry them for you. And I want you to take that burden today. I want you to think of that burden and take that burden that you may have been carrying for 40 years. And I want you to give it to the Lord Jesus. Cast your burdens on him for he cares for you. Give it to him. Often we hug onto it and cherish it. Let us give it to him. Decide you will forgive and enter into the process of forgiveness. And even if the other person never knows that you have forgiven them, they may be dead, they may be a long way away, they may hate you so much they never speak to you, even if they don't know, you are doing what the Lord Jesus did. You are doing what the Lord Jesus wants you to do. Forgive. And then, it may also be that you have done something. That you have caused deep offence. It may be that you have done something bad. And you know now Perhaps you didn't at the time how bad it is. And I want to say to you that you may need to pick up the telephone. You may need to write a letter. You may need to go and actually see that brother of yours, that sister of yours, that aunt, that uncle, that friend, that business colleague. You may actually need to go on your knees to see them, metaphorically speaking. You may need to say, I was in the wrong. Please forgive me. Because you know the Spirit of God will tell you to do that. And to seek reconciliation and to make the recompense that is a true apology. Even when I gave the apology of the church to the victims of sexual abuse, time and time again, the person would sit in perfect stillness as though these words had some extraordinary power to change them, to give them something, to bring peace to their hearts. And I believe even though you are a great sinner, and even though, yes, you've done many wrong things, so have I. The word in which you seek forgiveness may also have that power to bless another person. And of course I say to you, ultimately it's God we've offended. And all of us, all of us, and I trust it is true of all of us, but it may not be. All of us need to turn to God. Turn to God and be blessed by his gracious forgiveness, to be reconciled to God, because he is the great reconciler, and because God so loved the world, that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. Let us pray. 
Our Father God, we thank you for your word. We pray that you would help us as we struggle with this word to understand it and to apply it truthfully to ourselves and our situations and our lives. Father God, if there are any here who are struggling with forgiveness, we pray that you would help them to cast their burdens upon the Lord. If there are any here who are struggling with repentance, we pray that you would give them by the power of your Holy Spirit that grace to seek repentance and to seek forgiveness. And above all, Heavenly Father, we thank you because every one of us here is a sinner. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you have come to us with your forgiveness, grasped us with your grace, and brought us home to Jesus, who died for us on the cross. And we pray in his wonderful name. Amen.